So, uh, hello everyone. Um, I would like to thank the steering committee for letting me, uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work uh, in these good vibration seminars. And of course, I would like to thank uh, Rita for having presented me uh, to the audience. So, yeah, so I guess we can start. Um, so today I will uh, give you a presentation of a part, a large part of uh, my PhD, which is the seismic analysis of uh, evolved giants on uh, the red giants and on the Asafotic giant branch. And uh, today I will uh, show you how to constrain the internal structures of stars on the asymptotic giant branch. This is part of my work uh, under the supervision of Benoit Mosser and Evelyne Le Breton, and of course, uh, many important collaborators. So, the uh, outline and more exactly the uh, thought process of this presentation will be the following um, We will uh, investigate how the second helium ionization zone can be used as a physical basis to classify RGD and HD stars. It will allow us to constrain stellar interiors. So uh, by studying observations of the uh, P oscillation modes, uh, P modes oscillation uh, spectrum of uh, evolved giants, we will uh, investigate the seismic signature of stellar evolution. And thanks to stellar models, we will make the link between seismic parameters once extracted from observations and internal structures parameters from uh, stellar codes. So first, uh, I start with the scientific concerns and uh, context of this work. So basically, uh, RGB and HB corresponds to two different evolutionary stage in stellar evolution. So we have HB, which corresponds to the stage after the core helium burning, and the RGB corresponds to the stage before core helium burning. So it took the uh, core helium burning occurs between those two evolutionary stages. So we expect uh, to have structure differences between those two evolutionary stages. However, this is not straightforward to disentangle evolved RGB stars from evolved RGB stars. This is what you can see on the color magnitude diagram here including stars in the global cluster M5. So here we have RGB uh, represented by triangles and HB uh, by squares. At evolved stages, you can see that uh, it is not straightforward to disentangle them with uh, photometric quantities from observations. And if we look in stellar models, so for example, with the elspoon russell diagram for one solar mass star, you see that the RGB and the AGB are very close. So using uh, photometric related quantities, both from observation and of models, it is difficult to disentangle them. However, we see clear stellar structure differences between those uh, evolutionary stages. So for here, this is what you can see on the Kepanen diagram of a one solar mass star, the extent of the convective the convective envelope is not the same. We have an important mass loss uh, going through the HB. And on top of the hydrogen burning shell on the RGB, you have an additional helium burning shell on the HB. So you have clear structure differences. And we would like to know how we can efficiently disentangle HB stars from RGB stars. And we will do it by, uh, by using asteroid to bring constraints on the internal structure. So now we have several classification methods to uh, classify HB stars from RGB stars. Some of them relies on uh, clear uh, stellar structure differences uh, because the seismic parameters on which the classification method relies are sensitive to clear signature of stellar structure. Uh, this is the, the, the one of these method is the corresponds to the diagram delta pi one delta u, which is maybe uh, one of the most important breakthrough uh, knowledge. Uh, so, which gives 
the first evidence of seismic classification of stars at evolved stages between core helium burning stars and RGB stars, thanks to the work of um, Tim Bedding and his collaborators in 2011. Um, so it relies on the fact that there is a coupling between the G mode and the P mode cavities in a star, and this gives rise to mixed modes. These mixed modes are sensitive to the innermost layers of stars, as it is reflected by the measurement of delta pi 1. So delta pi 1 is the spacing in period for consecutive orders of G modes, which is, and uh, this quantity is represented as a function of the large separation, which is the uh, spacing in a frequency for consecutive radial order of uh, P modes. And you can see that we can disentangle uh, clearly uh, helium core helium burning stars and RGB stars. Uh, this method has been extended between RGB and HB, uh, thanks to the works of Mos uh, Benoit Moser and his collaborators in 2014, due to the additional helium burning shell in HB stars. Um, the issue with uh, this classification method is that this method is no longer applicable at low delta U. And we are going to see why. The measurement of delta pi 1 requires the observation of mixed modes, which is possible for large delta U at uh, intermediate uh, evolved stages on the RGB. But when the star climbs the RGB, uh, we are at lower delta nu, and we only see uh, the pressure dominated modes. So mixed modes are less and less visible at low delta nu, and we cannot use this classification uh, method any longer. So hopefully we have other classification method uh, that exists. For example, this one, which uh, focuses on the universal pattern of uh, red giants and more especially uh, the phase parameter epsilon inside this uh, relation. So here, epsilon is represented as a function of delta nu. And from the works of uh, Thomas Kellinger and his collaborators in 2012, we can clearly separate different stellar population uh, uh, with a cut between the stellar population. And we can disentangle RGB and HB stars. The issue with that method is that it does not provide a clear physical basis and a internal constraint for stars because uh, the epsilon relies on uh, the underlying physics on which uh, epsilon uh, depends is unclear. However, thanks to the works of uh, Mathieu Verard and his collaborators in 2015, uh, uh, they could identify the physical basis of this classification method. So if you take the universal pattern of red giants and you compute the, and you differentiate this equation, you will end up having a relation between uh, perturbation in epsilon and uh, perturbation in delta nu. This is important because it tells us that a local change in epsilon is finally uh, equivalent to a local change in delta nu. So uh, Mathieu Vrard and his collaborators investigated uh, what could lead to uh, local change in delta nu, and they identified the signature of the second helium ionization zone, uh, which is a modulation in the local large separation. This is what you can see here. Uh, more especially, the, uh, they highlighted differences in the phase parameter of the modulation. This is what you can see here with the core helium burning stars having a clear negative phase difference compared to RGB. So this induce, induces a, a difference in the delta nu, which can be interpreted, which is equivalent to a perturbation in epsilon. So it explains the physical basis of the classification method. There also exists another method, which is empirical because we do not know the physical basis on the, of this method, uh, which is by the use of the envelope autocorrelation function. 
So uh, the envelope autocorrelation function is defined as the uh, calibrated autocorrelation of time series, which is simply the Fourier spectrum of the Fourier spectrum of uh, the time series. And um, we can so we can measure this on the oscillation oscillation spectrum, and we can compare it to what we would expect from uh, evolved uh, red giants. This is what you see here, the predicted uh, value for evolved stars, which depends on the eye to background ratio, on the new max, and on the observation duration. So when you compute the ratio between those two quantities you can highlight uh, two different stellar populations, the RGB and the helium burning phase. But uh, here, we do not know the physical basis of this method. So the aim of this presentation will be to focus on the lower part of this diagram. And uh, we would like to extend the results of uh, Mathieu Vra and his collaborators that has been learned lead that has been led to core helium burning phase and we would like to check confirm if uh, rgb and hb can still be disentangled thanks to the second helium ionization so that's the first goal then we also would like to characterize the evolved star through the seismic signature in the oscillation spectrum this is important because we don't have uh, plenty constraint, seismic constraint for uh, asymptotic giant uh, branch stars. And finally, thanks to the link between observations and the use of stellar model, we will investigate how those seismic uh, signature uh, will give constraint on the, on the stellar structure differences between RGB and HB stars. To this end, we will be, uh, we'll be uh, studying the p-mode oscillation spectrum of uh, evolved giants. So first, I uh, quickly um, present to you the uh, sample of stars we used. So we considered RGB, clump, and uh, HB Kepler targets, for which we have uh, delta nu that is lower than 4 microhertz. And the evolutionary status is uh, kept following the uh, classification method uh, that uh, I presented to you before, the one based on the epsilon parameter and the one based on the on envelope autocorrelation function. Um, so we kept the uh, evolutionary status only when uh, two classification methods agree. If they do not agree, we consider that the evolutionary status is undefined. So here in blue, we have the RGB, and uh, in red, helium burning stars, and in gray, uh, the undefined evolutionary status. So uh, it, if we look at the histograms and particularly, particularly at a very low delta nu, we see that there, there are uh, the disagreements that uh, increases. And this is due to the fact that the classification methods are less and less uh, accurate due to less precise uh, mode frequencies extracted from the oscillation spectrum. OK, so we will investigate a seismic signature from the oscillation spectrum of red giants. So what does look like the oscillation spectrum of evil giants? This is what you can see here for an evolved uh, RGB stars. At a given radial order n, you have three main modes. You have the L equals 0, L equal 1, and L equal 2. And for those who um, work on uh, radians, you should uh, notice something, is that for uh, the L equal 1 mode, the non-radial modes, we only see one single mode. We don't have mixed modes. And this is due to the weak coupling between the P mode and the G mode cavities. So uh, the, the, the only modes that we see on the oscillation spectrum will be uh, interpreted as the, the pure pressure non-radial modes, both for L equal 1 and L equal 2. So how do we uh, characterize the oscillation spectrum of uh, evolved giants? So we model a template oscillation spectrum 
with uh, Laurentian modes and uh, underlying uh, Gaussian envelope. And the Laurentian follow the universal pattern of radiancy with the frequencies uh, reminded here. The seismic parameters are parameterized by the delta nu, following uh, the scaling relation found by Bruno Moser and his collaborators in 2011. And we extract the mode frequencies and find the optimal uh, delta nu by um, using a maximum correlation method. So we keep the best uh, matching template spectrum with observations. Once the, uh, the best uh, matching uh, template uh, oscillation spectrum is found, we apply a detection threshold, both on the mod heights and the mod frequencies, which allow us to extract uh, the uh, p-mode frequencies of evil giants. So at this step, we, we are able to extract the mode frequencies from observation, but we would like to compare uh, observations with uh, what we would expect from stellar models. So to this end, we use a stellar evolution code, MESA, and more especially a template, spectra, a template uh, uh, evolution from the, uh, P from the P PMS up to the HB. Uh, and we, uh, with the standard parameters, and we uh, modified uh, some uh, physics to correctly model the evolution up to the HB. So here, this is a non-exhaustive list, but we uh, include a core overshooting during a core hydrogen burn burning phase. We use the opacity tables at low temperature from isopus. We use different uh, mass loss prescription uh, on the RGB and the HB. And we took a solar calibrated model with uh, given helium abundance, metallicity, mixing length parameter at a given uh, initial metal uh, mass fractions. And from those uh, stellar models computed with MESA, we would like to extract the p-mode frequencies. This uh, is done uh, thanks to the stellar oscillation called ADPLS. But the main difficulty here is that, OK, from observations, we extract the pressure mode frequencies. But in stellar models, because there is still uh, cooking, even if it is weak, between the p-mode and the g-mode cavities, the oscillation code will compute the mixed modes. So this is what you can see here. So for the L equals zero mode, uh, we are not surprised because we only have one single L equals zero mode per interval of delta nu. But for non-radial modes, L equal one and L equal two, we have several mixed modes. And the ones that we are looking for are uh, the ones at, that are closest to the pure pressure modes. That means the on the profile of the mode inertia, the ones with the lowest mode inertia. So to extract them, we use a recipe that has been developed by Wyatt Ball and his collaborators in 2018, which consists in suppressing the mixed modes by setting the bone vice cell frequency equal to zero wherever we have a radiative zone. So this has been uh, tested by uh, Ray Ball and his collaborators. And this is what you can see. On the left graph, you have the L equal 1 mode and L equal 2 mode represented by a blue square and uh, orange diamonds, respectively. And uh, on the right, you have the residuals between uh, the pure pre-mode uh, obtained with this recipe by setting the bone vice frequency equal to zero, and the modes of lowest inertia with uh, highlighted with a cycle. So you can see that the, the agreements are satisfying for L equal to modes. Um, for L equal one modes, because we expect some deviations due to the mixed character uh, of the pure domin of the pressure dominated modes, we have some deviations but it remains uh, close to what we expect. So this has been computed for a red giant model with a delta nu that is lower than uh, approximately 
equal to 4.5 microns. So it works for uh, evolved RGB models. But this needs to be confirmed for helium burning stars. And this will be part of uh, our future work here. So finally, we have pressure modes from observations and the pressure modes extracted from stellar, pa pa stellar models. So now we would like to investigate the seismic parameters that could allow us to extract signature from internal structure. This is what we are going to do with the second helium ionization zone, which has been um, widely studied for uh, the sun, for uh, sunlight stars, and for red giants. So the second helium ionization zone is a region with the chart variation of gamma 1 over a short distance with respect to the wavelength of the oscillation. This is what you can see here on the gamma 1 profile uh, as a function of the distance from the center of the star expressed in units of uh, acoustic radius. So here you can see uh, the variation of gamma 1 induced by the second helium ionization zone. The depth of the variations here are noted the H helium 2, its width delta helium 2, and its location T helium 2. So, what's the impact of the second helium ionization zone? In fact, it introduces a modulation in the P mode pattern. So, you have the universal, universal pattern of regions, it does not include the signature of the, of the second helium ionization zone, and it adds a modulation. Delta nu and up. And this modulation is what we call a glitch and what we would like to extract. Well, in fact, we do not extract the modulation directly on the in the mode frequencies, but rather in the local large separation here. So what are we doing this? Because we will be comparing observations with model. And because because models are affected by near surface effect, we would like to uh, lower these effects. So we use combinations of frequency. Uh, here we use a difference of frequency for a consecutive radial order. So on the one hand, we compute the local large separation, which con does contain the signature of the second ionization zone. So from uh, the observations and models. And we compare the values that we would expect following the universal pattern of radians, which does not include the signature of the second helium ionization zone. So we compute the difference between the two, and we are able to isolate the modulation induced by the second helium ionization zone. This is what you can see here for an evolved RGB star. So here, the modulation can be uh, fitted by uh, damped oscillator model. So here you have uh, three key parameters, which are the amplitude expressed in units of delta nu. You have the period, same in units of delta nu, and the phase. So these are the three uh, seismic uh, parameters that we would like to investigate to see if we can uh, learn more about the internal structures of evolved stars. And I start with the modulation period G. So it is represented as a function of delta nu with the following color coding. So we have blue triangles, which represent RGB stars, red diamonds for uh, alien burning stars, gray dots for undefined evolutionary status. And for uh, the, uh, both evolutionary stage, we compute the median in uh, dark blue for RGB and in dark red for alien burning stars. And for a given delta nu, you can see that the period of the modulation is globally the same, or whatever the evolutionary status at a given delta nu. So we can compare observations with what would be expected from stellar models. And in fact, the modulation period depends on the location of the variation of gamma 1 induced by the second helium ionization zone, according to the relation written here. So it, it has been computed for uh, RGB and AGB uh, stars. And this is the black thin line that you can see here. 
both for, for RGB and HGB stars. So you can see that uh, there is no difference between uh, stellar evolutionary status. Now, if we compare observations with uh, stellar models, this time with the frequencies computed from AD poles. So here, this is the period, modulation period represented as a function of delta nu uh, for one solar mass star and with the following polar coding in blue for RGB. From the clump uh, to the HB, it is represented in orange, and in red for the RGB. A a G, sorry. So as you can see, there's no clear differences between uh, different evolutionary stage. So it seems uh, uh, fine with observations. But most importantly, if we compare the modulation that is extracted from high poles, and if we compare uh, that obtained with uh, the location of the second helium ionization zone, uh, we see that uh, there, there are clear agreements. We correctly extract the signature of the glitch. This is important because it tells us that the recipe that we use to compute uh, P modes seems to work for uh, those evolutionary stages. Another imp uh, interesting uh, thing that we can study with the observations is the mass dependence of the modulation period. This is what you can see here as a function of delta nu. And here, the mass distribution is highlighted with the color bar instead of the evolutionary status. And here, we computed medians for low mass stars and high mass stars. Low mass stars in blue and high mass stars in red. And you can see that it seems that there is a mass dependence for the modulation period from observations. If we compare it to stellar models, uh, so this is what we have for different evolutionary tracks with uh, different uh, stellar mass, uh, dark for low mass stars and uh, light for uh, high mass stars during the RGB. So you see that there is a, seems to be, to be a mass dependence for the period. And more importantly, if we uh, color code the effective temperature, we see that low mass stars have lower effective temperature than uh, high mass stars. And if we indeed represent the modulation period as a function of the effective temperature, we see that uh, finally, the mass dependence that we see is finally uh, dependence in effective temperature. For a given effective temperature, we have one single uh, modulation period. And in fact, this is not surprising because the, the location of the second helium ionization zone will depend on the effective temperature. Uh, if the, the second helium ionization zone would be closer to the surface if the effective temperature is uh, higher for a, for a fixed temperature gradient. So uh, we expect that the helium ionization uh, temperature occurs sooner towards the center when the effective temperature is high. So we have higher uh, modulation period. Now, if we're interested in the amp modulation amplitude, which is represented as a function of delta nu for uh, the same color code as before. We see that there are clear differences between helium burning stars and RGB stars. We have a uh, different uh, modulation uh, amplitude that is higher for helium burning phases than for RGB. And we would like to understand why. OK, so first, we would like to check if we are able to uh, reproduce this relation with stellar models. And as you can see, with the blue dots and the gray dots uh, for RGB and helium burning uh, phase, respectively, we, have, we are able to reproduce observations. So now we would like to understand from uh, stellar structure parameters why. OK, so if we remind uh, what the, are the effects of the second helium ionization in the 
low frequencies, it induces uh, signature uh, modulation, which is a perturbation from the universal pattern of white giants. So if the variations of the gamma one due to the second ionization zone are more important, we would expect that the modulation amplitude is higher. Okay. So if we study and if we represent the depth of the variation in gamma one as a function of delta nu for a different evolutionary status, we see that there are clear differences between uh, our alien burning stars and uh, RGB stars. And this, could, this explains the differences that we can see in the modulation amplitude between evolutionary states. We can even go deeper in uh, this interpretation, interpretation, thanks to the works of uh, Jörn Christensen, Dad Scarf, and his collaborators in 2014. Because if we represent the depth of the variation of gamma one as a function of the temperature at the second ionization, ionization zone, we see that there is a clear correlation between uh, those two parameters. And we have even a uh, unique correlation between those two quantities. This means that for a given effective uh, given temperature at the second helium ionization zone, you will have a unique profile for the gamma one. This induces uh, this is this reflects the fact that there are differences in the thermodynamic state of the convective envelope according to the work of uh, Jan Tristan Sedanskart uh, and his collaborators in 2014. So this is one of the main uh, uh, results that we can extract from internal structure. There is also an interesting thing that we can uh, study with the modulation amplitude is uh, the behavior of the modulation at low delta nu. Uh, so here we represent the full uh, amplitude uh, so in microhertz, as a function of delta nu, with the same color code for one solar mass star, and you see that at low delta nu, while it de while delta nu decreases, we keep a constant amplitude for the modulation. And this is a problem because, as you can see, if we represent the modulation parameters this time in terms of delta nu, we see that it fastly increases towards the delta nu. And this is a problem because the amplitude modulation, the, the modulation amplitude becomes of the order of 0 0.1 up to 1 in units of delta nu. This is a problem because we do not expect the modulation amplitude to be as high as the quantity delta nu that is perturbed by uh, the uh, second helium ionization zone. Uh, this signature is extracted from a perturbative approach, and we do not, do not expect the perturbation to be of the order of the quantity itself expected from the universal pattern of radians. So we may not extract the gleek modulation, and it raises the validity of the asymptotic approach towards low delta. Okay, so now if we look at the modulation phase, uh, as which is represented as a function of delta nu here with the same color code, we see that there is a negative phase difference between uh, alien burning stars and RGB stars. So finally, uh, this is what we wanted to have, right? Because as highlighted by the works of Mathieu Ra and his collaborators in 2015, uh, they obtained the negative phase difference to explain the differences between core alien burning stars and RGB stars. And here, we see that we extend their works. We still obtain this negative phase difference between HB and RGB stars, which explains the classification method of uh, Thomas Kellinger and his collaborators in 2012. So in fact, this difference in uh, phase translates into a difference in delta nu, which can be, which is equivalent to a difference in uh, epsilon. So uh, we have now identified the physical basis classify RGB and AGB stars, which is the second helium ionization zone. So let's see if we are able to reproduce these results with uh, models. So it is represented as a function of the value, 
modulation phase for one solar mass. And we are, in fact, able to reproduce uh, this phase difference. But this is for one solar mass star. If we look for higher mass, uh, we see that uh, uh, the differences fade when the solar mass increases. Uh, but this is what uh, this is not what we observe. Uh, as you can see here, this is the same graph uh, that I presented to you before from observations. But here we highlighted the stellar mass, uh, which is color coded. So here we compare the medians that we have for high mass stars. So what I call ma high mass stars is mass that is uh, higher than uh, 1.2 solar mass. Uh, and we computed medians for RGB in blue and helium burning stars in red. And we see that from observation, we still have this difference. So uh, we need additional physical ingredients to uh, reproduce observations. OK, so let's move to the conclusion. So what is important here? First, we have highlighted clear structure differences between RGB and HB stars, thanks to the signature of the second helium ionization zone. So if you had to um, keep in mind uh, two lessons from this presentation, these are the following. We highlighted uh, different efficiencies uh, in the convection uh, thanks to the works of uh, Jan Christensen, Dalgaard, and his collaborators, which leads to uh, different uh, temperature at the second helium ionization zone, depending on the evolution rate status. It, is, uh, it leads to different profile of gamma one. Uh, with uh, the unique correlation between uh, depth of the variation of gamma one and the, the temperature at the second helium ionization zone, and this can impact the modulation amplitude, and the glitch signature is more intense during helium burning phase. This is the first main conclusion of this work. The second is related to uh, classification of stars. So if we get back to uh, 2015. Mathieu Vra and his collaborators have uh, highlighted that the physical basis which relies on the uh, universal pattern of OGNs, epsilon, is in fact related to the second helium ionization zone. The stellar evolution effects are encoded in the second helium ionization zone signature in mode frequencies. Thanks to our work, we extended their works to more evolved uh, evolutionary stages between RGB and HGB stars. So we are able to disentangle RGB and HGB stars with the second helium ionization zone. Um, on top of uh, this important conclusion, uh, we, have, we have brought important seismic constraint on the HGB, uh, which uh, opens new window for uh, st the study of physical processes on the HGB. This is what we do, uh, for example, in uh, the first paper of uh, my PhD, which uh, deals, uh, one aspect deals with the measurement of the mode damping and the relation, the impact that we can have for the physical processes. We also, uh, we can also study important uh, events during the HP. For example, the bump of HB, uh, we can now characterize, thanks to observations of Kepler and uh, Tess, the, the bump of the HB in terms of mass and metallicity, the, the dependence of mass and metallicity. And uh, more importantly, thanks to the works of uh, Diego Bossini and his collaborators in 2015, they used the HGB bump to constrain stellar models, the, the mixing processes. This is something that we are currently uh, studying uh, because Diego Bosni and his collaborators study the uh, HGB bump to constrain stellar interiors, but for one single bin of mass and metallicity. And now we would like to uh, study the effects in uh, mass and metallicity on the, the constraint, how it impacts the constraint in the stellar models. 
So uh, a few words about the prospects and the aspect that can be developed in uh, my world and my, co my uh, supervisor and supervisors and collaborators. So what we can do is to, uh, thanks to observations and uh, stellar models by comparing them, we can still investigate the dependencies of seismic parameters with physical ingredients in stellar models, such as the mixing lens parameter, the core overshooting during the helium burning shell, uh, burning uh, core helium burning phase. Because as you could see, for uh, high mass stars, we are not able to reproduce uh, the difference uh, between the helium burning stars and RGB stars at evolved uh, for uh, high mass stars. And uh, another aspect that we could uh, investigate is the performance of the classification for low mass stars, for, for uh, low delta nu, sorry. Um, simply because at uh, low delta nu, uh, we are limited by the frequency resolution, and this leads to uh, higher uncertainties on the more frequencies, which leads to a less accurate classification method. And finally, it has impacts for the galactic archaeology, because thanks to uh, the, the seismic characterization of asymptotic giants, we are now able to study the HB bump. And this can be interesting to study if uh, the HB bump can be a suitable candidate for standard condos. That means if we are able to show that the luminosity of the occurrence of the HB bump depends on the metallicity or not. And finally, the HB bump can be used as a calibrator for mixing processes, as illustrated by uh, Diego Bossini and his collaborators. And this has implications on the chemical composition of stars and its surroundings. So I guess I have finished. So many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for a very, very, very interesting talk. Um, I'm sure that we are going to have questions uh, about this uh, presentation. Maybe, so you can raise your hand uh, using the, the button. I, I was waiting for you, Jörn, <laughs> to raise it. OK. Um, let's go, Jörn, you can shoot. OK, so, thank you. Uh, of course, I should not be allowed to speak until much later because I'm not very young. But, but th thank you very much, Iom, for, for this very, very interesting presentation and, and very impressive work, both on the data analysis uh, and, and the modeling. I mean, clearly, uh, I'm delighted to see that the 2014 paper could be used for something. And actually, that, that your research seems to be con consistent with uh, what we found there about the effect of the heat ionization zone. Uh, there's just one ad additional point which uh, you might, I just want to remind you of, and, and that's really that the effect we see is, is quite simple uh, uh, consequence of the internal structure of the star. That might be relevant for your analysis further on, namely that in the, um, the uh, red clump stars, we have a, a bigger radiative core. So we have more of the stellar mass confined to the core and therefore less mass in the convective envelope. And that means that the density in the convective envelope is lower, and that is actually what shifts the helium ionization zone. So of course, that would also mean that if you somehow increase the mass of the core by OSU, you would expect to see an effect on this. And this may be what you're, being, you're, you're looking for now. So I think there's some very interesting diagnostics here, and, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, to see that carried out in practice. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I investigated that, but in fact, there are many uh, parameters that uh, <laughs> impact uh, the uh, second ionization zone. And for instance, uh, so maybe I can uh, get one of my uh, additional slides. Uh, okay, sorry to get back. But there are uh, interesting works that has been uh, led by um, Pierre Oudaillé uh, uh, in his PhD, uh, which is uh, who is uh, working uh, with uh, with me at uh, Paris, 
And they highlighted that uh, the profile of uh, the gamma one uh, for the second ionization zone, uh, there are many other parameters that impact this uh, region. So this is what, ah, sorry. I, uh, Okay, this uh, this one. Okay. So in fact, there are, for for example, here the uh, helium abundance. So, well, we expect uh, the uh, helium abundance to affect the variations of uh, gamma one, so uh, the characteristics of the second ionization zone. But there are also other parameters. So as you suggested, uh, that are linked to the uh, to the core of the to the helium core during the clamp phase. And on top of that, uh, more generally, it seems that uh, there also uh, it, there is also the electron degeneracy that mm. play uh, uh, that is uh, that play a role. For example, this is what you can see: the shape of the variations induced in gamma one uh, depends on the, the electron degeneracy, uh, and not, and of course, on top of uh, this parameter, we also have the, uh, the location of the second helium ionization zone, where we can see, so I'm going to reduce this window. We can see that depending on the location of the second helium ionization zone, with the parameter that is related uh, to the location and uh, many other parameters, such as effective temperature and uh, delta nu, we see that the profile in gamma one is not the same. Uh, here, uh, it is wider for, um, uh, the more it is uh, close to the stellar, uh, stellar core. So uh, yes, there are many other parameters that can be uh, investigated uh, to, to study the uh, effects of uh, stellar parameters in, in the, the second helium ionization in signature. And of course, the uh, mass uh, fraction in uh, the stellar core uh, is one of them. Uh, ab absolutely, that, but what, what we found there was precisely that it was a uh, much lower density that played a role, and, and that, that might be worth looking at again. But, but thank you again. I look forward to seeing the further work on all this. <laughs> and uh, I think that Pierre will be giving a good vibration seminar in the second part of this uh, school year, most likely. <laughs> Um, so, any other question in the audience? I strongly encourage uh, the younger audience to, to dare to ask one. Uh, so you can raise your hand. Okay, if not, I can ask a more down-to-earth question, uh, if I dare. Um, so you talked in the very beginning of your uh, presentation about uh, classification uh, methods, and uh, you mentioned some empirical ones and some more like physically motivated ones, um, and you use both of them in your uh, selection method. Can you can you why don't you use one of them? How do they compare? Okay. I guess that in the Red Giant workshops, you've worked on, on this extensively. <laughs> of course, yeah. And uh, this uh, was very interesting because it gave, uh, gave rise to uh, a collaborate, collaborative work. So uh, the problem is that uh, at very low delta nu, as uh, I said, both classification methods are inaccurate because of uncertainties in mode frequencies. Uh, so here, what you can see on the, the slide are uh, so the sample of stars we used in the plane. Uh, in a, so for both classification method using epsilon and uh, the ratio of the auto, uh, auto uh, envelope autocorrelation function. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, in blue, you have the agreement and uh, in red, the disagreement. So as you can see uh, for both uh, diagram, you have uh, well not a lot of um, disagreements are at uh, high delta nu relatively to the number of stars we have. And uh, most of the disagreements uh, are due to the fact that they are close to the separation, to the cut, uh, cut relation. 
between uh, RGB and HB. Uh, but at very low delta nu, we see that there are a lot of disagreements between uh, those uh, classification methods. And if we look uh, how it compares with the total number of stars we, are, we have per bin, we can see that. So here it represents the percentile of disagreement. We see that at very low delta nu, it uh, largely increases uh, towards uh, decreasing uh, delta nu. So, um, and that's why we need to, uh, to have clear, accurate evolutionary status to use both classification methods. And this is, uh, as I uh, told it in my talk, this is reflected by the fact that we have high uncertainties on uh, the parameters. So here on the left is the uncertainty on epsilon and uh, on the right, the uncertainty on the envelope autocorrelation function. And we see that it uh, largely increases. Um, so in that case, uh, we also studied, uh, we also kept the stars for which uh, we, we were sure that they were correctly classified independently for the two uh, classification methods. And we uh, defined a uh, p-value to evaluate the distance from uh, the epsilon to the cut relatively to the uncertainty we have to the parameter. So x can be uh, epsilon or eta. And we can see that uh, even for uh, the, the, the evolutionary status for which we have, we are sure that we, are, it, we, are, we have strong evidence that uh, we have RGB or uh, AGB uh, or a core helium burning uh, stars. We see that the disagreements fastly grows at uh, very low delta nu, uh, uh, like uh, 30%. Even if we keep uh, strong evidence in both classification methods, so that's why it is important to consider both classification methods uh, in uh, in our study, because uh, they are not uh, very accurate at uh, low delta nu due to less precise work. Okay, thank you. So basically, you got rid of a big part of your sample. At a very low delta nu, yes. Okay. Thank you. But of course, we uh, still analyze them, but they are not uh, kept in uh, the analysis when we want to compare RGB and helium burning stars. Okay. So, uh, I see that Sebastian has raised his hand. Uh, hi, Guillaume. Thank you for your presentation. It's nice to hear about uh, AGB stars. I had a question about mass loss. You said that you uh, incorporated it uh, in your models. Um, what, it, what would be the effect on the, on the location of the second helium ionization zone? Is there a prospect to, to be able to say something using seismology about uh, the amount of mass which is lost on, on the AGB? Mm. Uh, interesting. I think uh, so. The main impact uh, on uh, the, in fact, what we uh, noticed in uh, stellar models is that this is not necessarily the uh, the mass loss on the AGB that impacts uh, the stellar structure on the AGB, but mainly the mass loss during the RGB. Uh, so maybe the mass loss during on the AGB will as uh, will have impact on the stellar structured, but not uh, in the range of uh, delta nu we focus on. So uh, it happens at uh, more uh, at the tip of the AGB. But mainly what we noticed is that the main parameters in terms of mass loss that has impact on stellar structures is the mass loss we have on the RGB. So uh, I investigated uh, the impact of mass loss on uh, the signature of the second helium ionization zone from models. And just let, let me have a quick look, but I think that there is no uh, important uh, 
there's not a lot of influence on the parameters. Uh, okay, so for the mass loss, uh, there, uh, there is a, yeah, I uh, found uh, maybe an effect on the phase parameter for during the helium burning phase when we uh, change the mass loss on the, the RGB. But I uh, don't think that I noticed other changes. Going, uh, so f taking uh, 0.3 for the Rymer's factor, uh, up, and if we change it to uh, 0.1, we didn't find a lot of difference, except for the phase parameter. OK. Because uh, if you lose a bit of mass, in principle, you should change the radius of your star. And if you yeah. keep the luminosity, it should change your temperature. And if the temperature changes, I would expect the, the location of the, of the ionization zone to be modified a bit. But maybe this is a bit naive. Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh... In, in fact, this is a work that is uh, on progress. So, <laughs> yeah. May, may I think that if we uh, strictly uh, look at the location of uh, the second helium ionization zone in gamma one, I think we should uh, see uh, some impact on mass loss on it, on it. But here, on the using the pressure modes that we extract from edibles, I didn't know think something important. So this may be due to uncertainties and. Yeah, care must be taken. Must be taken. This is the work in progress. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Okay, so something to look forward to. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think we will stop now because it's eleven, and uh, I would like to thank you very much, Guillaume, for a for a, a very interesting work and and talk, and also very complete answers. Um, so um, thank you, everyone, for showing up. And see you not in two weeks, but in four weeks uh, for a talk given on uh, massive stars uh, by uh, Simon Bursons from KU Leuven. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, please, the steering committee, stay put for our meeting. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, Guillaume, again. Thank you, everyone, for being present. Bye-bye.